Good morning. Welcome to St. Peter's. I'm Pastor Jerry. Senior Pastor Tom is away this weekend. Uh, if, you look, <laughs> if you look around, there might be an empty spot next to you. We have about 60 of our members away on a marriage retreat this weekend. So you can keep them in your prayers this morning uh, as they are studying God's Word to, to try and enrich their lives together. Um, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we welcome you. In the back of our pews, there are blue visitor's cards. If you'd like to fill one of those out, give us some information. We'd love to speak to you. And if you need a visit from myself or Pastor Tom, you can include that. Uh, we are a praying church. And later today, we're going to have an opportunity for an intercessory prayer for any of your prayer needs. There are pink prayer cards in the back of the pews. If you'd like to fill one of those out, you can drop those in the offering plate when it comes around. At this time, we take time to greet one another in the Lord, say hello to our neighbors, feel free to mingle. You might have to walk around a little bit. Well, we may be few, but we're happy to see one another, right? Let's uh, continue our worship this morning as we collect our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, this morning we lift up to you those of our congregation who are away, Lord. We just ask that you bless them in their worship service this morning, Father, that they find those words, Father, that it takes from your word to encourage them to love and care for one another even in a greater way. Father, as we come to this time of the service, we know, Lord, that everything that we have is because you have blessed us. And we ask, Lord, now that we take these tithes and these offerings that we return to you, we ask that you use them in the furtherance of the name of Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Amen. couple of announcements this morning while the offering plates come around. Uh, Teenagers Breakfast, Tuesday, March the 10th at 8 a.m. That's at Mason Dixon in Shrewsbury. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Uh, support group, S-O-U-L. If you or someone you know is grieving any kind of a loss, join the soul group Saturday, March the 14th at 9 here at the church. Uh, an annual congregational meeting, March the 15th. Immediately following worship, uh, church family luncheon is Sunday, March the 1st. That'll be right after worship as well. Please bring a covered dish and join us in that fellowship time. Um, least of these ministries annual banquet will be on Sunday, March the 29th from 2 to 5. There's uh, details on that in the bulletin. And also we will be having another fundraiser where we uh, raise money for the um, building fund, and that will be through the sale of the meats and seafood and frozen desserts that we did last time. That will be coming up February 23rd. You'll get information on that next week. We've got it, Jacob. If everybody could... Hello. If everybody could please stand. <laughs> Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Stop. 
Jesus, you 
to 11. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him?
Our Father, we praise you and we thank you this morning for your spirit that is here with us this morning as we lift your name in worship. We just ask, Lord, now as we go into this time of studying your word that you would open our hearts and minds, that you would find somebody to bless this morning, Lord. Just ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Who's keeping score up there this morning? Steve, you got it? Don't forget an assist for Tila. Thank you, T. <laughs> Do we have a PowerPoint, Steve? Children of church, or children of God, you are dismissed. Mr. Eric's back here doing jumping jacks. This morning, we will be moving into the third chapter of our study in Revelation. And uh, we're still in the letters that Jesus gave to John to the different churches of the time. And the church that we're talking about this morning, in this letter, it's one of the harshest criticism that Jesus gives to a church, even though the church appears to be doing really well. Um, I, I can't tell you how astonished I am at how much fun that I'm having in Revelation. And we're going to have a little lighthearted stuff this morning with the message um, just because of the way that it spoke to me and how I try to relate it to folks. Um, Karen and I have known one another and have shared our Christian walk for a long time. And we're, we're very old. But since we were kids, since we were in Sunday school class together, we've had many discussions about the book of Revelation. And Karen has always found the book of Revelation to be exciting and to be something to, to study. And when she would see teachers on, preachers on television talking about Revelation, she would say, come on, you got to see this, you got to see this. And my comment to her was, I don't need to know about all the doom and gloom I just need to be ready for when it happens. If I'm in the right walk with Jesus, I don't need to know all that. She says, but there's signs and there's, there's things to know when. I said, my Bible tells me no man knows the time or the hour just to be ready. So that was always my philosophy, just be ready. When Pastor Tom came to me two years ago, and he said, you know, Jerry, he said, I really am interested in doing a series on Revelation. I said, Tom, I don't know if congregation's ready for that. I said, there's, there's so many ways that you could slip into the doom and gloom. So we did a studies on Corinthians. <laughs> and then about halfway through Corinthians, Tom said, you know, I'd really like to do that study on Revelation. I said, well, I don't know about that, Tom. He said, get ready. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really surprised, not that, you know, what I've learned and what I've found from Revelation, but that I'm having fun with it, that I'm able to have fun with it. Revelation is about Jesus Christ. It's about the Jesus Christ that was when the earth was created. It's about the Jesus Christ that walked this earth. And it's about the Jesus Christ who has already won and is coming back to get us. That's what it's all about. And that's fun. So this morning we're going to talk about the church at Sardis a little bit and the problem that they had and how we can relate that to our church. And we'll see what we can do about having some fun with it. Sardis was known for its great wealth. And it may have been the earliest kingdom ever to use minted coins because of the amount of wealth that they had. Sardis was located at the foot of Mount Ptolemus. 32 miles from Pergamos and about 27 miles from Philadelphia. The city of Sardis and its surrounding area were watered by the river Pactolus. The river was known for its golden sands, which helped the city become prosperous when gold was found near its banks. The city was also noted for its fruits, wool, and the temple to the pagan goddess Sibel. That's the temple there shown on the screen to the goddess Sibel. Sibel, 
and the temple um, was famous in its worship, which was very similar to the worship that we talked about to the goddess Diana that was happening at Ephesus. The worship, the things that were going there were immoral, prostitution. There was even belief of the people in the area that the goddess Sibel could bring people back to life from the dead. There's no historical fact of that, but it's what they believed. There's the area we're talking about. Sardis was the ancient capital of the kingdom of Lydia. The kingdom's most noteworthy king was a very wealthy Croesus. Croesus ruled from 560 to 547 BC. He was the first person in history to strike pure gold and pure silver coins to be used in the marketplace. His father, King Eleates, who reigned from about 600 to 560 BC, minted and distributed the world's first coins. They were made of an alloy of gold and silver. There it is in Turkey now. Sardis in John's time was a trade center known for textile manufacturing, dyeing, and jewelry. Sardis had been Lydia's capital and was proverbial for its riches. To this day, our idiom, as rich as Croesus, which I've never heard that idiom, acknowledges this fact. For Croesus was a king of Sardis who had almost unlimited riches, yet who led the Lydian Empire into defeat and decline. Sardis epitomized the complacency, softness, and degeneration which invariably, ultimately, accompany wealth. There's an important word in there, and it's in your notes on their number six, and that word is complacency. Sardis was also considered a mountain fortress. The temple that you see there was built on top of a mountain. And the mountain fortress was thought to be undefeatable, couldn't be beaten, except through the negligence of the people that was defending it. The rock on which Sardis was built was friable. Friable means that although the slopes were precipitous because of the cracks and faults, that it was climbable. The city was defeated around 600 B.C., and it was defeated again in 250 BC by two different armies who utilized a similar attack. In 600 BC, when the Persian army came to defeat them, they were camped at the bottom of the mountain region. And they thought there was no way possible that they could ever get up to the top of this fortress and be able to defeat the city. And then while they were all sitting around the fires one night, trying to figure out their strategy, something happened. One of the Sardian soldiers from the top of the mountain dropped his helmet. And his helmet rolled down to the bottom, near the base of the mountain. Well, the Sardidian soldier, familiar with the the land, climbed down to get his helmet. And as he climbed down... Someone from the enemy saw him, and they went back to camp, and he said, Hey, Sarge, we just saw this cat over here, dropped his helmet, and he climbed back up, and he made it, and we watched which way he went. And by doing that, they were able to capture the city. And again, in 250 B.C., the same exact thing happened. Not that the helmet rolled down again, but that it was remembered by the attacking army how they were able to get to the top. Now, when they got to the top, the reason that they were able to very easily capture the city was that the city was sitting on top feeling they can't get to us up here. They had become complacent. They had become comfortable. They had gotten to a point where they thought that they were undefeatable. When that helmet rolled to the bottom, they learned a little differently. title of the message this morning is Waking a Dead Church. The church at Sardis had become complacent. They were satisfied. They were a vibrant, thriving church. 
from all appearances. They had lots of money. They could do whatever they wanted financially, build or do mission work. But what does vibrant really look like? What does vibrant look like to us? We're a church that enjoys fellowship. We're in church that has things going on around the community. We've got mission work going on. We're sending people to the DR. Hey, we're even a hand-raising church, right? That's, that's evidence. Is that evidence? Could be. You know, there's a, there's a Christian preacher out there right now, a songwriter and comedian, and his name is Tim Hawkins. <laughs> Tim Hawkins has got some very great material, but one of the things that he talks about is the hand-raising that goes on in his church. He's from a Pentecostal background, and there's a lot of hand-raising that goes on at his church. And in his church, they actually have names for some of the hand-raising that the people are going to do. Now, we'll talk about those a little bit this morning. And since he knows it better than anybody else that I know, Mr. Joshua Clunk, one of my youth, is going to come up and help me with it. Josh, come on up. Hey, and you guys... You guys can keep Josh in your prayers. He's nervous right now. But also to keep him in your prayers because as part of our youth group, we've had some discussions and Joshua is seeking God's will for his life. He's got decisions that he needs to make about his education, what he's going to do, where he wants to go. And the first thing that he wants to do is ask God where God wants him. So you can keep him in your prayers after today for that. And I think we pretty much have ruled out the MBA. Yes. All right. So, the different kind of hand raisings that we have in church, for most men, anyway, it usually starts with your hands in your pockets. Because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. And until that Holy Spirit rips the hands out of our pockets himself, we're just going to sink them down in there. We're not interested in raising our hands. And then when something happens... We get started off. The first one that comes out is carrying the TV. Yeah, Josh has got Josh is carrying the TV there. So from carrying the TV, the next the next iteration is to go on to the big screen TV. Yeah. We're gonna carry the big screen TV. From the big screen TV for the fellas, there's my fish is this big. Yeah. Fishermen do not always tell the truth. Mm-hmm. My fish is this big. From my fish is this big, we go on to holding the baby. Hold the baby. And then changing the light bulbs. <laughs> now we're up to two hands so we could do the goalpost. Ah, a lot of people, once they get up to the goalpost, they do a heartburn. Uh, then they'll go to the double heartburn, right back to the goalpost. <laughs> the goalpost, an easy transition is to Mufasa from The Lion King. Ha ah, ah. ha. <laughs> then we can go on to those that are the one-handers. And the one-handers are pointer, hatchet. Before we go on from hatchet, if you all see Miss Renee do the hatchet over here while she's singing, she's not necessarily doing the hatchet. She's telling Dominic to flip the screen on the song. <laughs> so pointer, hatchet, schoolroom. Release the doves. Ah. <laughs> From release the doves, we go to a high five to the Lord. Give the Lord a high five. That's it, Joshua. Press it out. Give him a high five. <laughs> and from up there, some of the ladies, they like to do wash the windows. Uh, wash it good. Get it clean. <laughs> yeah. And if you're very comfortable from there, you can go on to the big three. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. Thank you, Joshua. Good job. So where does hand raising for you, where does it come from? Where does it originate? Where does it, where does the Holy Spirit, how does the Holy Spirit impress that on you to praise the Lord in that way? It's biblical. Raise your hands to praise the Lord, holy hands. And I tried to think about that, and I really had a tough time equating that into human terms. And then I thought about something. You know, 
Karen and I both come from very big families. Um, big. My great grandparents had 16 children. Um, so Karen and I get invited to a lot of weddings. We get invited to a lot of parties and anniversaries. And there's a lot of times there's a band there. And I just am not a dancer. You know, through all the weddings and all that, one obligatory slow dance with my wife just to make sure that she knows I still love her, that's enough for me. I, I mean, I've got a brother who's a little bit younger than I am, and he does the electric slide and the, oh, whatever they all, all the rest of them. He does them all, and he gets into it. But that's just not for me. I'm just not moved by that. But then I do find that while we're there, at times... There's always one song or something that comes on, and I'm like a throwback to the disco era or halfway between disco rock and roll, and sometimes there's some songs that come on. We have one, Steve. If something comes on, there's just something about certain songs that I just can't stand still. When they start going, it just makes something inside of me want to move. Do we have it? They're working on it. <laughs> Tila, can you help with that? <laughs> Experiencing technical difficulties. Cancel. Scratch. All right. So, the song that comes on, if any of you ever heard of it, is Cool and the Gang, Celebrate. Celebrate good times, come on. <laughs> it, just, it, just makes my, it just makes my shoulders do that. And to me, for me, there are times when I let go of my stubbornness and I let go of my pride and I'm praising the Lord for the purpose of praising him and nothing else. That there are times that my shoulders just let go. That I just have to reach out to him to try and get closer. That's where, for me, the hand raising comes from, for me. Let's talk about Sardis. If you want to open your Bibles, we're in Revelation 3, starting with the first verse. It's also, that text is also in your bulletin, incomplete, so you can, you can read it there in the bulletin. Um, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Dead. Remember, we talked about they have a reputation of being alive because it looked like that from the outside. The church was growing. The church was vibrant. People were coming to find out what was going on there. But it wasn't going on for the right reason. Christ emphasizes in, to this church that he is the source of the seven spirits of God because of his assessment that they're dead. Remember now, in each of the letters, when Jesus talks about himself, when he introduces himself, to the church in the letter, it's in a little bit different way. And here, Jesus is saying that I am the source of the seven spirits because you are dead and you need life that comes from me. It's the specialty of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to bring forth life from that which is lifeless in a wilderness. The seven spirits of the Holy Spirit and his mission, as we have seen in verse 1 4, all spiritual life is created by him. The Lord sends us his Holy Spirit, even if he's poured out the Spirit on Pentecost. Thus the Lord is the one having the seven spirits. In Revelation 1.20, Jesus says that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Thus the message is going to the star of the church at Sardis. Although the church in Sardis had fallen into sad spiritual complacency, Remember that word, it's going to come into play. Complacency, she was still the object of Christ's care. Jesus was still telling her that 
they could be vibrant. Verse 2 says, wake up, straighten what's main and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Wake up is a loud cry. It's a warning. The church at Sardis had come under the most severe denunciation of the seven churches, apparently untroubled by heresy and free from outside opposition. It had so completely come to terms with its pagan environment that although it retained the outward appearance of life, it was spiritually dead. That means that they had gotten to the point where they were coming to church just to come to church. They come to worship because that's what Sunday morning was for. That's what we did. They sang songs because they liked the way that they sounded. The things that they were doing were just a result of what we did, not because it was guided by God's Spirit. Verse 3, remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come. Secondly, Jesus commands the church to repent, prompt True repentance is the only one remedy for the death that has set in and all the sin that has set in. Unless they repent, judgment will come unannounced like a thief. Why do you think Jesus used that term here? Like a thief in the night throughout the Bible. Like a thief in the night. What do you think these Sardinians at this point remember from their history, from their heritage. How did their city get taken from them twice? By a thief in the night. When judgment comes, it will be too late. The judgment will come swiftly. The same symbolism is used in the second coming of the Lord. But here the figure is not related to that event. The judgment upon the church at Sardis, however, is going to be just as unexpected. Sudden and irrevocable as that which is related to the second coming. Verse 4. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. There were some in the church who had not soiled their garments. They had retained their loyalty to Jesus Christ. They did not adapt themselves to the luxury and the pleasures of their pagan environment. They had not become secularized by the philosophies of the day. First, Jesus says, those who overcome will walk with me in white. In white is a phrase generally used for clothings or robes made white. That is, white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore white because of Christ's righteousness, not their own. Verse 5, the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. The ones who overcome will not be blotted out of the book of life. Very clearly, this promise reassures the faithful believers. The form of promise in the present passage is an assurance of salvation in the kingdom of God. All true believers are comforted by this promise. Third, Christ promises the one who overcomes that he will confess his name before the Father and the angels. Being faithful, Jesus will confess your name before his Father and the angel. This promise reminds us of Matthew 10, 32, which says, Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father, who is in heaven. Verse 6. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now remember, we talked about let him hear. Let him who has ears. We talked about that earlier in the book of Revelation. But in the past phrases, Jesus says, let him who has ears to hear. 
here, Jesus says, let him who has ears. That's everybody. Him who has ears to hear were those who were able to hear and put into play, to put into their daily life, to put into their walk what they had heard. This, again, is part of the warning. Let him who has ears is to everyone what the Spirit says to the churches. This message is from Jesus, but it is the Spirit also who speaks, and the Spirit is still speaking to us through the Word and through His guiding presence. Our prayer is that God will give us that ability to hear. Now again, like I said, I like to try and take things and bring them to our level a little bit. So when I started thinking about the church at Sardis, where they were, thinking about where we are as a church, and thinking about our church in general. The church at general was a, or the church at Sardis was a very rich church. They were probably a pretty haughty church. When I look at good old little St. Peter's, I think of a different kind of people. As a matter of fact, without being rogue about it or insulting anybody, I would have to say if I thought about us, me included, that all of us have a little bit of red on our neck. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. There's a lot of flannel shirts in here right now. And there was a guy not too long ago who had a catchphrase that talked about us people. If you know it, you can repeat it because a couple of the things that he came up were, if you've ever cut your grass and found a car, you might be a redneck. If your wife has ever said, honey, move this transmission, I need to take a bath, you might be a redneck. If you consider a flannel shirt dressy casual, you might be a redneck. If your estate consists of one home that is mobile and three vehicles that are not, you might be a redneck. If one of the windows in your vehicle is a hefty bag, you might be a redneck. If your favorite cuisine is only available at the county fair, you might be a redneck. If you accidentally wash casts in your pocket, and consider that money laundering, <laughs> you might be a redneck. And I know that hand raising thing. If I ask you to raise your hands, I know I touched some of you there. I know some of you have been hit by that. See, so the church that we're talking about at Sardis, they had become complacent. And the, we talked earlier about raising your hands to praise the Lord. That really isn't a sign of the spirit in the church because that could be anything but what are those signs what are the things that we need to look for to make sure that we're yielding ourselves to the spirit of God danger of complacency number one the story of the cross no longer moves you wow this is probably the most dangerous of the five that I'm going to go through. But the story of the cross no longer moves you. This sign is probably the most dangerous of them all because the cross is the foundation, the cornerstone of Christianity. The story of the cross of Christ is what motivates mankind to imitate Jesus and to follow God. The story of the cross represents the foundation of the home of the husband and wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. The story of the cross is one which established the new covenant, the sole standard for Christians living in worship today. The cross must continue to motivate us. It must continue to be on our hearts and break our spirits to the point of crying, Abba, Father. It must move us to regretting our sins and moving towards a pure, godly life. We talked about the redneck, but if the story 
of the cross no longer moves you, you might be complacent. Danger of complacently number two, church services bore you. While the first sign of spiritual death is by far the most devastating and dangerous, the second sign is probably the most common of them all. Likewise, this sign is also one that is the most obvious when viewed by regular men. While many signs of spiritual death are only seen on the inside of one's mind, this one is reflected on the outside by your actions. That is, checking your watch, being on your phone, sleeping. How many times have you been anxious for the dismissal prayer at the end of a sermon? How many times have you been drowsy during the sermon and songs? It's very easy to come into this phase because many factors come into play. Being busy, busy weekends, hard, week, hard work of week, medications, and not very good preaching. <laughs> That's one of them. If all church services bore you, you might be complacent. Danger of complacency number three, you have lost interest in saving souls. This is a very common crisis in many congregations today. We have lost the urgency of spreading the gospel to non-Christians. Many people might have the interest in personal evangelism, but might feel as they don't know enough, which thus holds them back. Some might feel that it won't do any good and that people don't obey the gospel anyway. Such an attitude denies the power of the gospel at its core and therefore the power of God. This mentality misunderstands the relationship between the Christian and the world. If you've lost interest in saving lost souls for Christ, you might be complacent. Danger of complacency number four. Still reflecting on the things of the world, one other side of spiritual disease is that the ways and the practices of the world attract you. This is not to say that it not be tempted. We will be. Rather, if the world has become your priority, your passion, and the church is secondary, spiritual death is knocking at your door. Have you given way to those things of the world that attract you? If you're attracted to the world, you might be complacent. Danger number five. The saddest form of spiritual death is without a doubt the denial of being dead in the first place. It is devastating because who don't believe they have a disease don't seek a cure from it. The Christian can easily fall into this trap thinking that it is well with their soul. Some think that God is too loving, too merciful to punish them for their minor sins. Are you fooling yourself? If you're fooling yourself, if you're lying to yourself, you might be complacent. The church at Sardis thought that they were a thriving, spirit-filled church. And Jesus condemned them harder than any of the other seven. He told them that they were dead. This morning, take a really close look at those five things that we just talked about. They're in your notes. Are you in church just to be in church? Are you here because it's Sunday? Because it's what you're supposed to do? Are you here to lift the name of Jesus, to worship him, to praise him for what he's given to you, and to ask him to fill those needs that you have? New Hope's going to come forward. We're going to have our final song. If you have any prayer needs that you'd like to pray for, if you'd like to pray for the fact that you feel like you might be getting complacent, I'll be here to receive you. And now we're going to have prayer for the intercessory prayers that we received earlier. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we lift up to intercede. For Nola Smith, Father, who is not doing well, Father, but we praise you that she is at home, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you bless and keep her, Father. Help her to continue in the healing process, Lord. Help her to be doing better. 
Father, we lift up Aria this morning who has a virus. Father, touch her body and free her from this virus, Lord. Help her to have peace and know that you are the one that can heal her. And Father, we lift up in the Dominican Republic, the K-9. We lift up Pastor Albert, Father, is there in their worship this morning. And we lift up the school children, Father. We ask that you continue to make the paths for the children to be educated, Lord. We ask that you continue to help provide the money that is needed, Father, and the clothing, Lord. And Father, the people to go there and help to see that these children are able to receive an education. And we just ask now that as we close in our closing prayer, Father, that you would guide us, Lord, that you would help us to understand that we need to be about the Spirit of God. We need to be led by the Spirit in all that we do. Help us, Father, not to allow complacency to sneak in on us. We ask all this in Jesus' most heavenly name. Amen.
Our Father and our God, we praise you and we thank you, Lord. You are good. You are so good to us, Lord. We just ask, Lord, now as we depart from this place, that you would keep us all safe until that time that we come together in fellowship again. Guide and direct our paths. In Christ's most heavenly name we pray. Amen.